Oh, you know what? <laughs> we are in trouble. All right. Why is this not? Okay. Hold on. My owl was not plugged in. Let's see if uh, we're on owl. Perfect. All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Jamie Fitch. I am the town sustainability manager. Um, thank you for joining us uh, for the Pine Point neighborhood meeting for the town's vulnerability assessment. In just a few minutes, I'm going to turn things over to um, Leela Pike from um, GEI Consultants. They're the firm that the town has hired to assist and compile the vulnerability assessment for us. Um, just to give a little bit of context, um, this project is something that the, um, the, the town council funded as part of the fiscal year 24 budget. So it was approved in June of 2023 before the lovely January storms um, that happened this past year. So um, while the, the timing is really convenient that um, we've got a really um, good example of what things may look like in the future with sea level rise and storm surge and things like that. Um, this project has been um, in the, the planning stages for um, a while now um, and happy to kind of be getting underway. So um, if it wasn't um, clear in the information that you received about this meeting, um, we held a large public meeting um, for the, the full Scarborough community back in August where um, Leela and her team talked about all of the data that they are looking at and analyzing to help um, pull together the vulnerability assessment. She's gonna touch on that a little bit this evening, but not go into very much depth with it. So um, if you want to know more information about kind of the, the data behind the, the information that Leela shares tonight, I'm gonna um, recommend that you go um, and look at um, the, the presentation that was given on August 12th. Um, and there is, um, a link to it from the vulnerability assessment project page on the town's website. You can get there by going to what's happening or stay connected, what's happening. And then there is um, a page for the vulnerability assessment. So will, the, will the end product be a completed packet or booklet or report that can be made available to everybody so that you can take it home and read it? Yeah, so the end product is actually going to be what's called a story map. So it's going to be essentially a website, an interactive website with maps and data and links to other information and resources um, where you can go and explore and zoom into um, various areas, Pine Point, for example, to see how things may um, affect your property and the surrounding area in the future. Um, there will be an executive summary, um, a, a written and produced executive summary um, that can be um, printed as a hard copy. Um, but really the, the bulk of the information is going to be available online. And the goal of the town is to update that information as um, more data becomes available, as areas are addressed and things like that. And I want to um, reiterate too, this vulnerability assessment is really the first, the town's first step at looking at our flooding vulnerabilities and preparing to be, or working towards becoming more resilient to flooding. So this is really meant to identify that our top areas of concern, help us prioritize how we're going to address them in the future. And then we'll have to seek funding um, and to do engineering and implementation in the future. So this is step one of many, many steps um, for the town to, um, to work on in the future. Um, well, good, everyone's sitting. I saw the, uh, there was the uh, the elliptical machine over there. I thought that was a person standing. <laughs> There's an empty seat right there. All right, so um, this is a great, great turnout. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, and we've got folks online also. So um, people on Zoom, if you have questions um, throughout the presentation, feel free to raise your hand or um, put them in the, the chat and I will um, ask them for you. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Leela. Thank you. Uh, Jamie just covered so much of the presentation, so I get to get sure the fun that. stuff. My name is Leela Pike. I am a civil engineer at GEI Consultants in Portland. I'm joined tonight by Elon Gatko. He will help along with some town staff as part of a breakout session later tonight. Um, and 
Tonight, I'm here to talk to you about the Scarborough Flood Vulnerability Assessment, but also um, specific flood risk to the Pine Point area. So the overall project, I'll just touch on quickly of what that project is and what the goals are. And um, and then again, this is this meeting is just about transit. But the overall project is to understand the coastal flood risk in Scarborough. So coastal flood risk is flood risk due to storm surge and sea level rise. To understand which areas and which infrastructure are at risk of flooding and by what timeline. So is something at risk right now? Is it not at risk yet, but maybe in 2050 it will be at risk um, after the sea have risen a little bit? And to help using that information, prioritize infrastructure for adaptation. Prioritization is based for some part on the risk of flood exposure. So what is most likely to experience flooding, which is typically what is lowest in elevation or right along the water. But it also has to do with how critical that infrastructure is. Oftentimes in Maine, we'll have roads that dead end on the water and that end of that road might first experience flooding, but if the end of that road is flooded, it really doesn't impact that many people versus, you know, if Pine Point Road is flooded and this little neighborhood is then impacted. Um, Pine Point Road was maybe not the greatest example because it is highly at risk of flooding and it does impact a lot of people, but there are some roads that may not be um, top of the list of at risk, but but are can impact a lot of people. So we will provide that prioritization for timeframes for when things should be adapted, and as well as provide a high level overview of what those adaptation options could look like for that infrastructure. As part of this project, we will be introducing pilot projects so those will be um, three to five areas or pieces of infrastructure that we home in on and develop concept plans a little bit further than just broad adaptation options. So those will be selected over the next several months between um, GEI and the Oversight Committee as part of this project. And then throughout this whole process, community engagement. So there was an initial, an initial townwide meeting where we introduced the project and talked about the methods for how we will conduct the flood vulnerability assessment. I do recommend you go and watch that if you haven't. I will not be going that in depth on how we develop the flood risk here. We'll be talking more about the results. And there were two communities that we anticipated would have higher flood risk than others, Pine Point being one and Higgins being the other one. We've already had our meeting at Higgins a couple of weeks ago. And then there will be a final presentation at the end of this process. Recent flooding. So here is a photo I'm sure you have all seen. Um, this is flooding on Pine Point Road. This is probably the January of this year, but perhaps it was March, but I think it was January. There were several times this year that you all know where there were high tides, storm surge, and some increased sea levels that led to flooding. And to orient you all to Pine Point, you know, you know it very well. I just want to point out some areas. Um, Pine Point is the on the western bank of the mouth of the Scarborough River. Some people call it the Nunfetch River. What do people call it? Nunfetch? Okay. I, it's both is I have seen. So at the mouth of the Nunfetch River, um, the main access point is Pine Point Road, although you can evacuate sometimes to Old Orchard Beach. Um, Jones Creek is the name of the, the Marsh River area that is inland of Pine Point. And um, the town landing is very low in elevation and kind of at the northwestern corner of the peninsula of Pine Point. 
sand dunes. And this says Hagen's Beach, but this is my point. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> sand dunes. So sand dunes, we're going to talk about that a little bit because that will be a big driver around adaptation for this neighborhood. I'm sure you have all seen the sand dunes along Pine Point, the vegetation, the profile that changes over time based on storms. Main Geological Survey goes out and maps um, areas of sand dune. They have different designations, frontal sand dune and back sand dune. Um, and I think our next slide is showing that map for Pine Point. So the majority of the Pine Point neighborhood is designated as a sand dune. This red hashing area that you see um, is generally where the front dune is, but it's also what they call an erosion hazard area. So sand dunes that are subject or likely subject to erosion due to wave action. And we have seen that here in Pine Point. And um, the area outlined in yellow is the back dune. And so this, it really is most of the neighborhood. Um, this is important to know because there are very strict regulations around activities that can occur in a sand dune area. I want to point out um, just some changes that you can see in sand dunes just looking at aerial imagery. So we did not go out and survey the sand dunes, um, but just looking at a imagery service that we have access to, you can kind of get a sense of what has been happening in the sand dune. So this is the most recent aerial imagery from the site. It's from May, 2024. So after the storm that we had this past winter, um, we've just drawn this blue line roughly at the edge of where the vegetation is. And this is just for one, I just wanted to zoom in on one section of my point, but this, this is, you can imagine this along the full extent. Um, so this is from May 2024, and the next slide is from May 2018, so six years ago. And so that blue line is still the same area, um, and then you can see how much more vegetation there was. It's about 30 to 60 feet um, of vegetation loss of, from the dunes, um, and that is mostly due to that wave action. Dune grass does a really good job of holding everything in place. And they do what they're intended to do. So waves come in, dunes take up that wave energy, and it really decreases those waves before they get to that infrastructure inland. As the dunes erode or we lose dune grass, that protective potential does decrease. Um, and it's not necessarily gone forever. Dunes do grow back over time. As long as there is a sediment supply and um, to allow that to occur. And one thing that we do as scientists and engineers and municipalities sometimes is engineer dunes. And so we do dune restoration projects. You can create dunes that have engineered material underneath. So they're a little more um, resistant to erosive action from waves. That's one of the things that we'll talk about in terms of adaptation. But this is just a picture of what has happened here over the last six years. Another interesting thing I want to point out, though, is you can see over the last six years, and these pictures were both taken in May, which is important because there's differences in how the sand moves within seasons. But if you look up against the breakwater, so this is this photo is May 2018, and I'm going to go back to May 2024. But you'll notice that May 2024 has a lot more sand. So here we go. May 2024, you can, and the tide is around the same. So what I'm pointing you pointing out to you is this corner over here. So I'll go back. This is recent photo, and then that's six years ago. So there's actually a lot more sand, and that's our general understanding of the sand migration in this area as it is moving up the coast. Um, so there is more sand. There's also more wave action that is 
removing that vegetation. So sand dune restrictions. I want to go over this so that we're all on the same page for when we talk about adaptation. These are very general bullet points about projects that are and are not allowed in sand dunes. There are always exceptions, but if we were to whittle it down, um, here are some projects that would not be allowed in a sand dune area, which is a high point neighborhood. So not allowed would be new seawalls, um, including sloped barriers constructed out of rock, such as riprap, wood, concrete, or similar materials. Expanded road footprints, so elevated roads. If you elevate a road, you either have to expand the footprint of it or create a wall, and walls are not allowed. So elevated roadway is generally not allowed in a sand dune. Uh, closed fences in the frontal sand dune area mapped also in a V zone, a FEMA V zone. New structures are not allowed or additions to existing structures. There are some exceptions to that. Projects that would be allowed in a sand dune zone. Pile or post foundation, so elevating your house using piles. Replacement of patios, decks, driveways, walkways, porches, or parking areas. Moving an existing seawall landward. Um, or replacing an existing seawall with the same exact dimension, so nothing higher. Temporary structures are allowed, so left anything that's up for less than seven months, that would be allowed under the sand dune rules. Uh, repair of up to 50% of an existing structure beyond 50% repair, then it's subject to some of these rules. Uh, elevated boardwalks are allowed. So this would be, you know, you can imagine a boardwalk that's going up and over a dune and then back down to the beach. Mm. Uh, beach nourishment and sand dune restoration projects are allowed. Um, rerouting of a road from a frontal dune to a back dune is allowed. In general, the idea is, is that we're trying to preserve these sand dunes and allow them to grow, um, move backward if they want to move backward. And so that's that is what the basis of these views are. Okay, so flooding scenarios that we looked at in this study. I didn't talk about this in Higgins. This, I go into depth of this during the first presentation. I want to just touch on it quickly now. We wanted to look at flooding due to storm surge and sea level rise, and also high tides. So we looked at two different high tide scenarios, mean higher high water, which is the higher of the high tide of any given day, and the highest astronomical tide, which is, uh, some people refer to it as king tide, so it's absent of a storm, but where just a particularly high tide might get to. And then five storm surge scenarios, so a 10-year storm, 50-year storm, 100 year storm, 500 year storm, and then the tide level that was measured in January 13th of this past year, because that was the highest tide on record. And then we looked at five additional rates of sea level rise. And with all of these values, there's a matrix of water levels that we had. And then we found similar water levels throughout the to bring it down to 10 different mapping scenarios that we are looking at. So any given number in the mapping scenario could represent, for example, um, a storm with today's sea levels or just high tide in 2100. So there's different ways that you can get to that elevation. Um, and so we've brought it down to 10 scenarios. What this doesn't include is wave action. It also does not include rainfall events. So we are, we have brought in wave action, looking at um, FEMA's study of where waves would occur. So you'll see that in the maps that'll show. And there are some general rules of thumb for how you can look at wave action. But for the most part, we're looking at just that 
standing water elevation due to a storm or sea level rise. So of these 10 scenarios, you can generally think of the first few of them as near-term flood risk. So if there is something that is at risk of flooding in scenario one, two, three, four, or five, that would be at risk of flooding now. The last three scenarios, eight, nine, 10, we're not expecting to see flooding due to those scenarios until 2100 with quite a bit of sea level rise. Mm -hmm. All right, so now I'm gonna go over the maps. Um, three different time frames: near term, 2050 and 2100. For 2050 and 2100, we're going to look at just what would be flooded during a, um, everyday high tide, and then what would be flooded during the storm in that time frame. For near term, we'll just look at the storm, and what I'll show you now is very representative of what the January 13th event was. So this is just for Pine Point. Um, I also, we also put the dune areas on here. There is some blue hashing and we have these printed out so you'll all get to see them closer when we're at our tables. There's blue hashed lines that show where wave action would occur. But in general, all the other blue area that you see, that's just standing water with no um, additional wave action. So now 2050, so this is just your high tide flooding. Um, really what we notice for Pine Point neighborhood is that it's the areas on the backside closer to the marsh that are really the lowest line where you start to see that flooding first, especially on the other side of Pine Point Road where it's, um, Pine Point Road represents a pretty big restriction in terms of connecting the marsh upstream and downstream of that road. For this study, we have assumed that there is no restriction in the flow there and that the water level on one side of Pine Point is equal to the water level on the other side of Pine Point. That probably is not reality right now unless the road is over top and it's really high tide. Um, a general goal for environmentalists in the state is for the Scarborough Marsh to have hydraulic connectivity on either side of these restrictions. So to, it is to open up these restrictions. So when you look at 2100, it's possible there will be a new bridge, many culverts there, some structure that would allow that free movement of water. Okay, 2050 storm event. So this is 1.9 to the sea level rise. That's kind of on the higher end of what the state is looking at for 2050. But we wanted to show you a worst case scenario for 2050. Um, this would be a 100 year storm event. Um, we're seeing quite a bit of flooding. And then again, a lot of the standing water flooding is really coming in from the backside of the Pine Point neighborhood. 2100. So first one would be everyday high tide flooding in 2100. So with four feet of sea level rise, you would expect to see um, anything in blue to experience flooding every day during high tide. And 2100 storm event. So this is 7.4 feet of sea level rise. So this is the highest level that the state is asking communities to look at and a 100 year storm event. So this is really like worst case scenario. And as you can see, it really is like doomsday scenario. Um, it's hard to plan around this and really look at this and think about what to do. I encourage you not to start there. Um, we will do a <laughs> process looking at time frames. Um, if you adapt incrementally, then you know by the time you get to this point, there will hopefully have been changes made already in terms of adaptation of this community. 
As part of, and it's okay if you can't read any of this, as part of um, this report and the story map and the products that we will be producing, we will have tables that list roads and other, other things like pump stations, other public pieces of infrastructure. And we will say what length of road or which assets are at risk under each of the scenarios we looked at. So here's an example of one of those tables for the public roads in the Pine Point neighborhood. So you can imagine that the roads at the top of the list are the ones that are most at risk of flooding. The one at the top of the list is Snow Canyon Road, followed by King Street, Pine Point Road, and then Jones Creek Drive. Those are the ones that are most at risk of flooding in this neighborhood. Um, and then we get to all of the avenues, and I won't go on from there. But this will all be available to you to look up, to look closely at um, eventually. Adaptation. So I'm going to provide a pretty general idea of adaptation. Nothing will be decided based on this meeting. The whole purpose of this is to just give the first look at these maps to introduce a general sense of what adaptation projects could be, and then to really sit with it and think about it and discuss um, what you would want in terms of adaptation. It's really brainstorming. There will be many more steps to this process before work is actually completed. So adaptation overview. Here are some general ideas. Top left, we have no response. So that is you do nothing, water dries, your house or your road gets flooded. Um, B, top right, is advance. This one wouldn't happen here and typically wouldn't happen anywhere in the state, but it used to happen. And that's when you would essentially, like for Portland, for example, a lot of downtown was filled in and built out into the ocean. So the idea being that you're moving closer to the water. That likely wouldn't fly permitting wise anymore. C, uh, middle left, we have protection. So that's, you build a wall, you, you prevent the water from getting to you, but you stay in place. D is retreat. So that is leaving the area, allowing the water to go where it wants to go and you move. Um, e down here is accommodate. So that is, you're still allowing the water to go where it wants to go, but you're adapting your infrastructure so that it doesn't get uh, ruined or damaged during flood events. And then F is ecosystem-based adaptation. So this would be like a living shoreline, a dune restoration system. These projects would reduce the wave action and reduce the damaging potential of waves, they would not lower the standing water elevation. They would reduce wave heights, but if the tide is coming up to a certain level, that tide's coming up to that level, whether or not there is green infrastructure there. So I'm going to go through a few more um, adaptation options. Uh, there is one class out on this list of seawall because when we looked at the dune maps, we saw that Pine Point is in a sand dune, and so new seawalls would not be allowed under the existing state of Maine sand dune rules. So structural measures for flood adaptation, elevating structures, um, wet and dry floodproofing structures. So wet floodproofing would mean that you have a house, you have, you, the water can, that's a good example. So if you convert your first floor of your house, for example, from into non-livable space, um, and that first floor can now get wet and you relocate it to the second floor of a house. Uh, dry flood proofing would be, you, you put like a barrier around your structure. Wave attenuation devices, these are engineered structures that are offshore and you can think of like an artificial reef system and that is there to break up wave action before it gets to shore. 
Uh, retreat, I have this in both structural and non-structural measures. Retreat could be an adaptation option as well. Non-structural measures or green infrastructure. So these are some measures that can be implemented sooner. Um, and when we talk about adaptation and resiliency, it's also about uh, not just the structures, but people. So a flood warning system, this is the first one we have there. A flood warning system would be, we know that there's high tides coming, we know that there are storm events coming, and the town gets out a warning system network. I know they already do a pretty good job of that, um, but alerting residents to which roads will likely be shut down during the storm coming, you know, make sure you have food, make sure you have water. Um, general emergency preparedness, which is the next one, flood emergency preparedness plans. This would be a town-wide plan of here are all the things that the town does when there is an emergency coming. Time point has a fire station at time point. That's one thing that we typically say is if there isn't um, a fire station in the area that will likely be flooded, then can you bring a fire truck there and to station there during that period of flooding? High water rescue vehicle, these are large vehicles that can travel through flooded water to rescue people that might be having a medical emergency. Temporary barriers and temporary flood walls. These could be, um, in the simplest form, this could be sandbags, but there are some um, pretty significant temporary walls that exist, and I'll, I have some pictures of those I'll go over. Uh, municipal buyout rent back programs. This is essentially retreat. It's just one way to think about retreat, and I have another slide about that. So we'll talk about that again, and then dune restoration. So that would be um, engineering dune, or maybe not even using engineered material, but replanting dune grass, protecting that dune area, and just trying to get that dune back to a larger state. Temporary flood protection. So here are some examples of temporary flood protection. Um, top middle, we have uh, flood logs. So that's really like building by building basis. You could do that dry flood proofing of your individual building. But beyond that, we're looking at um, tiger dams, pesco baskets, and deployable flood barriers. So these are pesco baskets, for example, are about four feet tall wire structure filled with a like a fabric lining and then filled with sand. And they're deployed one next to each other that you can stack them. It can be four feet, it can be eight feet high. Um, those are essentially temporary, although it would require like quite a bit of work to get them installed. But those devices like this could be in place for up to seven months at a time. A municipal buyout rent back program. So here's an example of how that would work. Municipality would buy out an at-risk property, a house that's at risk. They would buy it with a loan. This is how it could work financially, for example. Um, and then the municipality rents the property back to the original owner or to somebody else. And so they use then use that rental income to pay back the loan. And then that property remains occupied until the flood risk is such that it doesn't make sense anymore. The property is damaged enough that it no longer makes sense. And then that property um, is removed, for example, and it's a slow retreat process. Okay, that's all I have. Um, and now we have a breakout table. I should have mentioned this at the beginning. Please stop me or ask me now. I'll take questions now for a little bit. And then we're going to um, break out into tables. So you're all sitting at tables already, but just wrap around if you want to. And we'll have some people with you at each of the tables. And I might ask for a table volunteer um, if we don't have enough helpers. And you'll get a set of or multiple sets of maps to look at. And it's really open ended activity of just talk about what you think adaptation could look like for each time frame. So near term, medium term and long term. 
Um, as part of this, these printouts, there's a menu of adaptation options. It's open-ended. You can bring up things that we didn't talk about. Um, also think about sky's the limit in terms of cost. We're just brainstorming here. So um, anything goes. And discuss, you know, what your main concerns are with Pine Point, um, you know, which areas that you've noticed that are maybe not obvious to everybody, what you have noticed as residents here, what do you value in the neighborhood? We're trying to capture all of that. But before we get to that, I'm all, I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. Do you know anybody in the state who's using any way of attenuation devices? No. I don't. I know that Canada Court was considering something similar to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are. I have seen some reports similar to this type where wave attenuation devices have been recommended. Mm -hmm. um, as far as I know, none are used yet in the state. But I think that these types of projects, are, we mentioned this at Higgins too, these could be um, really good opportunities or prime examples of where a wave attenuation device could be used. Yes. Did you have anything to do with the uh, building up the berms over the Cross Neck um, on the eastern side above the beach park? Yes, I did not personally, but GEI did. So Barney Baker um, is the name that many of you maybe heard of. He was involved in that project and a couple other of our colleagues are. And so there was some dune restoration yeah. there. Yeah, they did a terrific job. And then they covered it with a uh, very heavy, um, it's like a cloth and put plums of seagrass in it. But they built that up to maybe 10 or 12 feet. And uh, there's 13 houses involved in it. Um, they really did a nice job. The other question I have for you, when you talk about uh, restraining or trying to bring back the wood, we, we've talked about uh, Christmas trees that were used in Thompson, for example, that to not wash away with it. Thank you. What about hay bales? Um, if you could maybe dig down halfway, let the uh, hay, hay bales sit halfway down, cover back up and gather sand as it came up. Build up over the hay bale, eventually the rock that we have to do and start to rebuild the stuff. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, <laughs> Pete Slavinsky, who's part of the oversight committee for this project, worked with a couple of colleagues of ours on a Living Shorelines pilot project in Maine. And I think that's when we're looking at Christmas trees. And I'll have to ask them if, about hay bales if those were considered. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Recognizing Mother Nature may not uh, appreciate a pound long so that the flow of water in your neighborhood can like, impact you. Are there um, thoughts about how you would um, make a plan that would expand the numbers of things that are available to the towns that are contiguous along the shore? I think that's a great thought. Um, because Old Orchard Beach is one of the escape routes really for Pine Point. Um, and I know that there are a lot of communities that do work collaboratively for these types of projects with a lot of funding options that are available for groups of communities. And I think in terms of long-term adaptation, um, definitely working together with your municipal <clears throat> neighbors would be effective. And I can't speak to any existing projects or conversations that are happening now between Scarborough and Little Orchard Beach. And then, you know, as we mentioned, this is really the first step. But one of the recommendations could very likely be, you know, create a working group with Old Orchard Beach and other neighborhoods. But, you know, just thinking of Pine Point, that is the neighborhood. Yeah. Yes. I think it needs to be noted that the town has done absolutely nothing to support the rebuilding of the frontal dune pine point. The last two dredges, you know, we've shipped the dredge spoils over to Cross Net so it can protect a golf course, but we've done nothing to rebuild the frontal dune at Pine Point, which has homes right along. And the, and the town has made no real effort to, um, to enable the depositing of those spoils over on this side of the room. 
Yeah, it's definitely worth talking about what that could mean in terms of bringing sand in. If you, if we were to look back at the pictures, you'll notice that there actually is the general movement of sand is up the coast, and there is a lot more sand. Sand separate from dunes, there is a lot more sand in Pine Point over the years that has been accumulating. Dune grass is different. That's what is um, affected by that wave action, what gets um, eroded over time. So there are measures that you can take to do some dune grass and planting. And you know, as part of the whole project, we'll, we will be looking at some recommendations for the town for what could happen. If, just to answer your question, um, Craig Martin is in charge of the Young Employee of Engineer. And I spoke to him. Uh, my attorney spoke to him, and unfortunately, his comment was mm -hmm. because most of Pine Point is covered by a conservation easement, until that easement gets changed, they can't do anything. And I said, well, Why does it always go with the plow snack? And he said, Because we've always done it that way. Jeez. You know, <laughs> and we, have, we have Angus um, Angus working on this, we've got a number of other people working on that. And the idea is we have to get our Easement wording changed to the point where they will allow us to bring the sand over to. Uh, no, I, I understand that, but they've been working on the wording change of that easement since the beginning. You know, it, 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 no, nobody's actually officially worked on it. I, I have my exactly, and that's the problem. Oh, no, let, me, let me finish. I paid out of my own pocket to have our attorney go to invest stuff, yeah, to try and get something done. And all I got was paper from now. We've got a action team actually working on this. Um, it is meeting tomorrow. We have a call tomorrow with Joe Anderson, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, to talk about this, to try and move this forward. So you've got a plan in place and we're going to take some action, but we've talked about it for a long time, but nothing's happened. I can tell you now something is starting to happen. And with Heather and Heidi, uh, and Mr. Silkman, who, uh, Rich Silkman, um, Sumner Littner, we've got a program that we are actually working on, and they are starting to listen to us. So uh, hopefully we can get something done on the next reg, which probably will be three to five years from now. It fills in pretty quickly. It does. Well, I, I think a lot of the issue that some people don't understand with the conservation easement okay. is it's all those homeowners, it's part of their, their deed of their property that they own. So unless all of the homeowners on that easement agree to something, then nothing can be done. So it hasn't really ever risen to the level that it has now of what the storms happened in January. So hence, we've been trying to really work with the Bureau of Parks and Lands, work with all the homeowners that are part of that easement, which runs from Hurry Park just until Charlie's property, um, it is a slow process, I will tell you that. There are things that we're trying to figure out what we can do without amending that easement as short-term solutions, and then what can we do if we amend the easement and look at long-term solutions three to five years out. Okay, I'm just gonna do a couple more questions and we'll do breakouts, so. You feel that the updates in three from 1985? They did update the view maps. Um, the new view maps went into effect of June, June 30th, maybe? Or June 20th, 20th or 24th. Yeah, yeah, June 24th of this past year. Right. Yeah. It was a long process. <laughs> All right. Okay. So um, I will ask that, you know, if there is room, maybe we'll. If there is room to wrap around your table, if not, you could just stay where you are. And um, I will grab my volunteer team. We'll meet you at each table. We'll have, we have these maps here.
stop sharing your screen, Lula. Hi, everyone online. So at this point, I'm just checking in um, with you folks who are joining us remotely. Um, we are in the process of doing a breakout group. If you would like to participate remotely, we can do that. Um, and for those who want to participate, if you just raise your hand, I will bring you in and you we can have a discussion um, on the items that Leela was just describing. If you do not want to participate, that is absolutely fine. Um, you are you can either um, kind of hang out for the next 20 to 30 minutes um, while we do the in-person small group discussion and we will um, come back and wrap everything up afterwards. Or if you would um, prefer to drop off of the meeting, that's absolutely fine. Also, um, this meeting is being recorded and will be posted and available online if you want to um, watch uh, the recording at a later date to see what the outcomes are. So I'm going to wait just a few moments. Anyone who wants to participate, raise your hand. Otherwise, I am going to um, turn off the camera and the microphone so that um, you're not listening to crowd noise and we will um, resume in about a half hour. Oh, oh, Kate, go ahead. Um, if you wanna type your question, you can, or raise your hand if you wanna ask it to me live. Can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. Oh, okay, good. I wasn't sure. I came in kind of late, but- um, That's okay. So uh, uh, my family's house is at 23 East Grand and um, right at the end of Oak Street. Um, we back up to the marsh. We're next to the uh, beach market store that we're hoping to get new people in next door. But um, my question to you, because I just came in at the end of that last round, was um, have, I live in Myrtle Beach, have you guys contacted anybody in a town such as Myrtle Beach or Charleston or Folly Beach or Sullivan's Island? I mean, we deal with hurricanes on an annual, annual basis. And I mean, I have watched, I've lived here for 10 years. I live right across the street from the beach. They've put up these little teeny fences to keep people off the dunes. And a storm is a storm. It doesn't matter what you what you dredge in there. They have spent tens of millions of dollars after Florence and Matthew, these huge storms, um, and it will wash away. I mean, the, the, the sand is always reforming. And just as you guys have seen in uh, Pine Point, that the current swirl of the current, you know, we have a beautiful beach there. Um, and then it got redirected with the last, with last year's storms, which were really the worst that, um, you know, I'm 56 and aside from a storm in the nineties uh, or late eighties with my grandmother, um, there was never any water anywhere up there. So um, I'm just curious before everybody goes through all this, um, you know, panic and talking of spending all this money on redirecting sand and barriers. I mean, I think everyone saw the house in Nantucket where the waves are just eating away at it. And it ended up selling for like, you know, 500,000 this summer because in two years, it's just going to be gone. So yeah. um, it's, you know, it's a legitimate question and every, there's always freak storms, you know, that's just nature. Um, you know, has, has anybody contacted anybody in anybody in these big cities that deal with this on a regular basis to see what works, if anything, because I'll tell so, you, I believe, I believe the grass is really the best thing because it holds the sand in. So yeah, yeah. So um, having a, a healthy dune system with grass growing on it um, definitely helps um, with the the wave action and things like that. So if you did join us late, um, what you may have missed um, Leela talking about was that um, we are looking at both um, wave action, but also just sea level rise in general. So the dunes aren't necessarily going to stop. Um, any damage or persistent flooding damage, um, for example. And what we're seeing when we look at um, at, at maps of Pine Point is um, 
the areas that are most prone to flooding are actually at the back of Pine Point, the area that backs up to Scarborough Marsh. That's where the lowest lying areas are. Um, and so unfortunately that's not a, that's, the dunes probably aren't really going to help in that area. And we saw um, the storms in January were a little bit different than the storms we typically face here because um, the winds were coming out of a, a totally different direction. So instead of coming out of the Northeast, they're coming out of the Southwest and it was causing water to back up um, in those marsh areas um, and yep. exacerbate the flooding. So um, yeah, we're just, we're seeing weather patterns that we haven't seen before. And part of this process is um, looking in multiple different phases throughout um, um, over the next um, 80 or so years to look at where flooding can be expected in the near, near term. So now between now and 2030 and the long term up until 2050 or midterm up until 2050 and then long term up till 2100. So if you came in at the very end, you saw like the, the scary 2100 scenarios. Um, and we're really hoping to look at this at a more incremental um, situation where we're looking at what's what's most at risk now and, um, and up until like 2050 or so. Um, and then looking more long term. So there's going to be many, many phases. And there's definitely things, as you mentioned, that we can um, look to other areas to understand what's working in those areas as well. Uh, we also need to understand that Maine um, in the Gulf of Maine has some of the highest tides in the world. And so um, with a very high tide range, oftentimes it's difficult. Um, it's, it's not necessarily comparable to what happens in South Carolina. Um, because our tidal range is different. So we can we can get some lessons learned and some information, um, but unfortunately it's not an apples to apples comparison. Well, I'll tell you, you wanna look at the king tides down here, they put things underwater. So yep. um, no, I'm just I'm just saying, you know, don't discount it, but um, so, okay, all right. Well, I'll, I'll just listen and wait for the results of the round tables. Well, and thank you um, for asking your question. Um, and before uh, I sign off for this point, this part of the, the meeting, does anyone else have any questions um, or comments that you wanna make? All right, thanks, Kate. Thanks again for, um, for joining and asking your question and for giving that feedback. We'll definitely um, work it into um, the considerations for um, as we move forward with the assessment. Everyone else, um, either sit tight or um, you can uh, watch the recording that will be posted and available later on this week.
up. I'm going to have um, a volunteer who took the notes from each table just kind of summarize the general thoughts of your table. So I'll start. Um, we discussed how it we are limited in what we could do because of the June symptom, because of easements. Um, but that an alert system or some sort of neighborhood alert system for when flooding could happen would help you plan around these periods of flooding. Of flooding. <laughs> and what's happening? <laughs> Um, and the general idea is, you know, if people want to live in this area, then they will need to elevate their house on stilts, probably. Um, and in the long term, you know, people weren't concerned as much, um, generally because we may not be here in the long term. <laughs> <laughs> um, is this the high school? <laughs> Uh, so, but really, in thinking about the long term, you know, we see that maps that show a lot of inundation, and so the idea, the question is raised of when when would you want to sell your house? When would you want to leave um, this area? At what point would you not be able to sell your house anymore? All right, that was my plan. I'm going to hand it to Emerson. Okay. Uh, in the near and medium term, a lot of questions came up about um, not necessarily the coastal side, but the flooding that's coming in from the back and what can be done about that um, regarding the restrictions or what would actually be effective in controlling that, you know, standing water flooding and not wave action. Um, kind of questions around like how high would you need to elevate your house if that was the way the community wanted to move? Um, if there was funding to be able to do that, how would that work? Um, there were questions about private paths they made to the beach through the dune um, on private properties, and if temporary barriers can be deployed in those, or like how we can work that out with property owners, um, or if those should just be built in as sort of dune nourishment. Um, yeah, kind of questions like just the, the temporary barriers. Um, in the medium term, a lot of concerns around high point road being the main access point, and that being very inundated. Um, yeah, and then long term, getting that retreat program together. <laughs> Did I miss anything? Yeah. Satisfactory summary? All right. All right. Thank you. Um, so, our table, we also talked a lot about the march, um, and perhaps rezoning some land in Scarborough to save uh, land for march migration and putting in more construction restrictions. Um, we'll start about dune restoration on the front side of Pine Point, and then identifying where water is coming through in through the back marsh, particularly around avenues four, five, and six, and maybe putting in temporary barriers throughout certain times of the year when the tide is higher. Um, we, in the medium term, we talked about uh, elevating houses is potentially the issue for the next generation of homeowners and a uh, loan program for elevating that. Um, as well as hardening utilities like sewer and electrical to keep those uh, safe for storm events and just keeping Pine Point Road open as long as possible. Um, and then in the long term, we talked about retreat. Thank you. Sure. So, near term, we talked about elevating structures. We also talked about um, stormwater conveyance and the we kind of made a joke of everybody's sump pump was just trading places with water. So we really thought we would actually be looking at it. Uh, and then some further clarification on the conservation easement and what can be done down there. Uh, the restoration, storm drain maintenance, ongoing maintenance and facilities that are there now. Um, a lot of grading potential. For medium term, and this really applies for everything, but we talked about evacuation concerns, alert systems, putting some sort of siren, cell phone warning system in place so people would be alerted. We talked about Pine Point Road and the issue with that, and its elevation and the evacuation route being really limited. And then long term, um, the buyback program really seems like a, a viable option. And then Wave attenuation is something really interesting to think about, and then learning from other communities and other places in the country. Yeah. 
One of the things we got into a little bit of a near term looking at um, the January storm event was it was interesting that a lot of the flooding happened on the inland side of Jones Creek. And so it sounds like that's what someone else spoke about coming in by Adam by. Um, and so looking at that, that dip um, and how that water is trapped back there, even when the flooding kind of subsided. Um, we also talked about um, not only just sea level rise, but our intense storm events and the rainfall events and maybe looking at impervious cover and as people add, maybe look at more forest haven as it comes down through. So that's it's a little parallel, but still it's not valid. Um, and then um, looking at um, other utilization, when we talked about hay bales and Christmas trees and different things to try to tap the demand um, in a natural way. Or a lot of our focus did also stem on evacuation. Um, process and programs, um, Ross Road being the key for this neighborhood also to make sure we can get out through there and looking at when does uh, the Goose Fair Brook crossing become a concern and so start looking at those type of things. Um, and in general, that this neighborhood was fortunate enough that we don't have a large population when the Ross Road event began during the winter. So having a viable like programs for alert systems in place and get notification for evacuation. Um, and then looking at the June restoration, and it sounds like there is a group um, working with some of our uh, legislatures uh, to look at funding for federal yeah. government funding um, for restoration once maybe this conversation easement language becomes um, resolved. Um, oh, and just newer homes and everybody kind of rising uh, up on the islands. And did I miss anything? Okay. <laughs> and there was actually one more group. I don't know. Do you guys? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're looking at modifying new restrictions in the near future so that we can build up the new. <laughs> the current restrictions we did not anticipate uh, increased sea level rise in the frequency or the end or the devastation of coastal storms. Uh, the restrictions were written way back. And they need to be modified and changed for the current climate. Uh, and then again, uh, medium term was uh, was escape plans on 2050, getting out, Jones Creek, et cetera. And long term, go back to the near term, work on restrictions. We're just uh, hands are tied right now with the current restrictions. They need to be updated and changed and modified for the environment. Yeah, just kind of an engine, kind of an engineering question, but. I mean, a lot of a lot of the January storm damage. Let's say was on the back on the on the Jones Creek side, down into the avenues, which are all swayed and I'm sure you've driven up the ladder. And so my question is, if you could gather up that water, I mean, we pump stuff every. Right? If you could gather up that water and pump it back into the ocean and on the seaward side of Pine Creek, just Water hydraulics means to think well, you pump it out there, it's going to just raise the level, it's going to come back right around again. But it can't, it can't do that. You know, it's, it's not a one for one. So, I mean, it, it is a solution, perhaps, be to, um, to limit the intrusion along Jones Creek, where, where, where it's known that it comes through, and then have some type of a collection system that takes it from because you're never going to raise the avenues and all the homes up. To a level that that is going to prevent them from flooding, but if you could if you could catch it at the low point, move it to a pump station. I mean, I have no idea how big this pump would be. Maybe it's <laughs> like the size of one of the, you know the, the the turbines in 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 Hoover Dam. But 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 move it to a central station and then basically pump it back out to sea. So, you know, such that you you keep the water moving. Rather than flowing in and accumulating, which is what it did, just sat in the avenues until the fire department came and pumped some of it out. Whatever. 
<laughs> so I mean, I think maybe it's a combination of things. Try to restrict the inflow as much as you can, and then have a way to at least mitigate some of, of what does get through. And again, it's for a very brief period of time in, in most cases, but in the case of the average, it's five weeks, two weeks, I don't know how long they have to be Yeah. So I have two a two part answer. Um in the long term, the goal for many agencies in the state, many environmental agencies, is to allow the Scarborough Marsh to grow unrestricted. So for the restriction at Jones Creek, Route 1, Route 9, Payne Road, all of these are considered restrictions that when the water is coming in from the tide or a storm, it gets blocked. It does get through, but the water on one side of the road versus the other side of the road, it's not the same. And the general goal is to make that the same, to allow the marsh to grow for environmental purposes. That is not going to happen tomorrow, although there are current efforts to reduce some of those restrictions, Route 1 and Route 9. Um, there's no current project around Jones Creek, although the long-term goal would be to reduce that restriction there. In the short term, before that, if there was no restriction there in the long term, then water that comes in, water goes out. This would mean that during rainfall events, that water um, is you know, spreading out more within the marsh, not just sitting on that one side. But during coastal storm surge events, that water is getting up into Jones Creek when it wasn't able to before. So there's um, you know, pros and cons of each. However, in the short term, if water is you know, sitting on these roads after the water has receded and the rain has stopped, there are, you know, there are always you know, engineering solutions to pump water out and move it. And one of the, when we talk about stormwater and rainfall, you know, that is an issue that we're seeing in the state is you know, water, rainfall coming, water sitting, and just needing to get that water moving. So th there are always you know, possibilities to do that. Other questions? Um, so I'll just wrap this up by saying that this project will um, is slated to be done in July of next year. Um, early in the new year, we should have the story map available for you to go and see. So we will advertise that when that is available. Um, there will be another public meeting probably in the spring, late spring, early summer, that will wrap up this um, project as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.